This discussion is about a local weather briefing. Before we actually pre-flight the airplane, there's several things we have to tend to before we go pre-flight. And if we refer to the FAR aim to see what the FAA actually requires of us, um, the FAR aim is our uh, book of regulations and airmen's information manual. The parts that are important to you and that the examiner is going to ask you about is part 43, which is about maintenance, preventive maintenance. Part 61, that's uh, the rules and regulations pertaining to how you get your pilot certificates and different ratings. And then finally, part 91 is uh, the regulations that you must fly by. So what my instructor told me a long time ago was part 61 tells you how to get your license and part 91 tells you how you lose it if you don't follow those rules. So anyway, this brings us to um, part 91-103 that says pre-flight action. One of the uh, questions the examiners love to ask on your oral interview for your uh, pilot certificates and ratings is do you have to obtain a local weather briefing and what is a local weather briefing? What, what is actually a uh, legal weather briefing? So I would like to just read um, this part to you. It says each pilot in command shall before beginning a flight become familiar with all available information concerning that flight and this information must include it says for a flight under IFR, that's instrument flight rules, or for an, a flight not in the vicinity of this airport, meaning that you're going to go land at another airport and come back, for example. Um, it says that you are responsible for weather reports, uh, forecasts, fuel requirements, alternate airports if the first intended airport can't be uh, made for some reason, and any ATC delays. And then in the next section it says, for any flight, you're required, that means a local flight or a flight far away, you're required to know runway lengths of the airport of intended use and the following takeoff and landing distance information. So the only way to calculate out your takeoff and landing distance is to have done a weight and balance form and also get a local weather briefing. So the overall catch-22 on this anyway it says that a pilot is responsible for all available information. So to answer the question properly, is a legal weather briefing required before each flight? I would say yes. So um, the, how we obtain a local weather briefing is two different ways. We can either use uh, a telephone and call 1-800-WX-BRIEF or you could call, uh, you could use a computer and access Duwatts. But either way, it's still going to the flight service station and it will give you the same information. Just one's computer format and the other one you can either listen to an automated one or you can actually talk to a weather briefer. Now when you talk to the weather briefer, it's pretty standard the format and the information that they're going to give you, but they need to know some things um, from you first. For example, what type of airplane are you flying? What equipment does it have on board? Um, how long are you going to fly for? Uh, where are you going to fly? Information like that. So the easiest thing to do is use the flight plan form that the flight service station uh, uses also. And we're going to answer the first 10 questions. I'm just going to take this up here so we can see it. We're going to answer the first 10 numbers on this. And the first thing it wants to know is, are you flying VFR, that's Visual Flight Rules, or are you flying IFR, that's Instrument Flight Rules, or are you going on a D VFR, which is if you're going to cross the defense zone that borders our country. The next thing it wants to know is your aircraft identification. This way it's documented. They know that the pilot of that aircraft has called. That's what makes it an official legal weather briefing. The next thing they want to know is your type of aircraft and the type of equipment it has. So for example, you're a Cessna 172 slash Alpha, and we'll go over those codes later, but it might mean whether you have uh, mode C capability or DME capability or you have GPS instrumentation on board. The next thing they want to know is your true airspeed. How fast are you going to fly? So let's just say maybe 100 knots. And again, we'll go over that information later when the time comes. The next thing is it wants to know your departure point. So for today, we would tell them we're departing out of um, this airport, which is Golf Mike Uniform. And then it wants to know uh, what time will you be departing. And they ask for it in Zulu. So Zulu time for us in South Carolina is we have to convert 
uh, UT, U, UTC time, uh, which is Greenwich, England time, and then in the summer months we subtract four hours, and in the winter time we subtract uh, five hours to convert it from Zulu into our time. If we need to convert it into Zulu time, we would have to add four hours, and then in the winter time add five hours. So for example, if we intended on leaving at um, 12 o'clock our time, that will be noon, then Zulu time would be, you got to put it in military also, which will be uh, 16 hours, 1600 would be Zulu. Because it's our local time plus the four hours to put it into Zulu. Okay, and then it wants to know what is our cruising altitude. So just for your first local flights, typically we just tell them about 3,000 feet. That's the altitude we're going to you know, perform our slow flight and stalls and steep turns and stuff like that. So 3,000 and then a route of flight. If we're just staying local, you just tell them local and we're not going to land at any other airports. Or if you know you're going to go to a neighboring airport such as Pickens County Airport or Anderson Airport, then you just tell them that you're going over there. And then the destination, of course, would be back here at Gulf Mike Uniform. They also need to know the time and route. So you, do you expect to be in the air for an hour and a half, two hours? Typically an hour and a half to two hours is good. If you ask for two hours, they're going to give you the weather pertaining to that two hour time block. So if you just simply use one of these flight plan forms and you answer one through ten, that is the information that they need and in that order. So for example, I would call the weather briefer and um, tell them that I am requesting a standard weather briefing for a VFR flight November 4642 Juliet. It's a Cessna 172 slash Alpha 100 departing Golf Mike uniform at 1600 Zulu, 3000 feet, local, not landing at any other airports, coming back to Greenville downtown, Golf Mike uniform, and uh, two hours, zero minutes in route. That's what they need to know to pull up the information that they're going to give you. Now I'm going to remove this for a second. And let's go over the information that they need to give you. It's always going to come in the same sequence. And I'm going to take this one up here to show you. And let me backtrack on one other thing. I did mention that we needed to request a standard weather briefing. There's three type of weather briefings that you could ask for. The first one is an outlook weather briefing. An outlook briefing is used if you, you want the information greater than six hours in advance of your actual flight. Or you could ask for a standard weather briefing, which is a complete flight briefing. Oops. So we'll call that one complete. The ter third type of weather briefing you can ask for is an abbreviated briefing. And an abbreviated weather briefing is just an update of information that you've already acquired earlier. So how this works is, let's say that you have a flight tomorrow morning and you're very excited tonight to go on your flight, but you want to know how is the weather going to be. So you would call first and you ask for an outlook briefing because your flight is greater than six hours in advance. And they will give you just a general picture of the weather, but they can't give you the fine details because, you know, it's, it's not current enough. So then the next morning, you get up and you're ready to make your flight plan, you'd ask for a standard weather briefing where they would give you all of the information that I'm about to discuss with you. And let's say then you go out to pre-flight and unfortunately there's a flat tire for some reason and it's two or three hours later by the time the mechanic comes changes the tire before you finally get to fly. So you may want to know, have the winds changed? Uh, did the weather at your destination change or anything like that? So you could call the weather briefer again and ask for an abbreviated weather briefing for just any updated information that you want. And you, you state specifically what you want, the winds aloft or you know, the visibility at your destination or anything like that. So those are the three types of weather briefings that you can ask for. Outlook, standard, or abbreviated. Now let's come back to the standard weather briefing that I said is complete. And it's always going to come out in the same format. They start by giving you any adverse conditions. Adverse conditions would be, like, is it IFR, instrument flight rules, or is it VFR, visual flight rules? and also any really important notums. Notums are notices to airmen, and it could be something like 
the airport that you're going to is closed because there's an air show, or it could be the airspace is closed because the president is visiting or something like that. So a lot of times they'll um, give you pointer notums that points out any really important information that you may or not may not want the rest of your weather briefing. Okay, next with the adverse conditions, um, the FAA wants a very quick, easy way to let you know about the weather. Is it moderate or is it severe? You know, is it kind of iffy or is it really bad and you should not go fly? So how they um, put these into different categories is they put them under air mats, sigmats, and convective sigmats. So air mat. Sigmat and then convective sigmat. Um, an air map is moderate weather, but it does not include thunderstorms. Thunderstorms are abbreviated as CB, which means cumulonimbus clouds, which you'll kind of get used to that. So I'm just going to put no. CBs, no cumulonimbus, which means no thunderstorms. Air mats immediate, I mean, I'm sorry, sigmat, as soon as you hear that, it immediately means severe. So it's severe weather, but no thunderstorms. So no CBs would be included in that. Um, thunderstorms are so important to aviation that they need their own category, and we call them convective sigmats. Convective or convective activity means a lot of moving airflow, which a thunderstorm has. So think of convective as uh, like moving airflow of a thunderstorm, and then it's significant meteorological conditions. So those are definitely severe thunderstorms. Okay. Now, what actually could be considered moderate weather that is not associated with a thunderstorm? Um, there's basically three things, IFR, or turbulence, or icing. And they give them these fancy little identifiers that go with it. So if we say air mat Sierra, that means that there's an air mat for IFR conditions. Now don't worry too much about it. Um, that Sierra means IFR, and Tango means turbulence, and Zulu means icing, because usually in the briefing they will say there's an air mat Sierra for IFR conditions, or there's an air mat Tango for turbulence or an air mat Zulu for icing. But the examiners like to ask you, what is an air mat tango? And you should tell him that, or her that it's moderate turbulence not involving thunderstorms. Okay. Now once we go to the sigmat, we're talking about significant meteorological conditions, which are severe weather conditions, but do not include thunderstorms. So uh, certainly we could have severe turbulence. We could have severe icing. We could also have volcano ash. And we can also have dust storms. Um, they do not associate the same lettering with the uh, sigmats, so don't worry about that. Just remember that if it says there's a sigmat, no one should be flying in these conditions. Not airliners, you know, not general aviation, because it is severe turbulence, severe icing, severe ash from a volcano, or severe dust storms. Okay, finally we get to the convective sigmat, which has to do with thunderstorms. And what do they consider a severe thunderstorms? If there's three quarter inch hail, if there's any tornadoes, if there are uh, a line, uh, like a big long line of thunderstorms, if there's embedded thunderstorms, embedded means hidden in other clouds, um, and then also a large area, they consider severe thunderstorms. So any one of these Air mat, sigmat, convective sigmat, um, it's just weather uh, conditions, but that's how they distribute it out to us. So they're usually going to start your uh, weather briefing with those. Are there any, you know, is there any air mat, Sierra for IFR conditions? Is there any turbulence in the area? Anything like that. So you'll see that we use this little form here at this flight school, and it just helps you write down the weather quickly as they're giving it to you. So air mats, sigmats, convective sigmats, and then they come up with TFRs. And a TFR is a temporary flight restriction, and I gave you an example earlier, for example, if the president visited or a large sporting event such as the Super Bowl, or if there's a natural disaster, when the oil spill happened, when a hurricane happens, 
then they will issue, the government will issue a TFR temporary flight restriction so um, you would not go fly in that area. Okay, the other thing mentioned on here are PIREPs. A PIREP is a pilot report. It's what the pilot actually sees and experiences during their flight, uh, during their flight conditions. Um, anyone can make a pilot report. The uh, weather service people love for us to make pilot reports because it is an actual weather instead of just a forecast. Um, and then any other flight advisories, and then they can tell you VFR not recommended. They can't tell you to go fly or not to go fly, and usually they will caught, you know, be on more of the cautious side and try to get you not to go fly if they feel like that the weather is a bit iffy for a uh, VFR pilot. So they may say VFR not recommended. <clears throat> The next thing that they will tell you is the synopsis. The synopsis is the overall weather patterns, which we're going to go into detail later. But for example, they may tell you that there is a, a low pressure uh, to your northeast and there's a cold front moving in the area and you can expect some thunderstorm activity in front of that cold front, which is driven by a high pressure. And then usually we'll just sketch it out on the little map here because it's easier to quicker and easier to sketch it out than it is to hand write all of it. But the synopsis is your overall uh, view of the fronts and pressure systems. The next thing that they'll usually give you are the current conditions for your departure, your en route, and your destination if you're going away from the airport. And then they'll give you the forecast conditions, again, for your departure, your en route, and your destination. The reason that they want to give you the current conditions and the forecast conditions is so you can also note the trend of the weather. Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? And then they will give you the winds and temperature aloft. So several places around the state or each state, they release uh, the big weather balloons and um, uh, the one in our area is actually released from Greer which is only about 10 miles away from here. So they release these weather balloons up and on the way up the balloon gathers uh, data uh, as far as temperatures and pressures and the wind and stuff on its way up. So that's where we get our winds and temperature aloft from. And we have on here GSP because that's our local one. And they'll give you the winds. So for example, they'll tell you the direction the winds are coming out of. So let's say that this is north, south, east, and west. And they report that the winds at 3,000 feet are coming out of 300 degrees at 15 knots. So it's telling you the direction the wind is coming from as well as the speed of the wind. Okay, um, and you know if we're going on a cross-country flight plan you may also be interested in gathering the winds from 6,000 and 8, uh, 9,000 and you notice that the winds aloft come in 3,000 foot increments as well. But for a local flight usually we just tell them 3,000 feet is mostly all we're concerned with. So this is what you can expect for a local weather briefing. Just to reiterate, is you want to have a flight plan form so you know which information the, uh, the, the flight service station wants from you. Then you have to tell them do you want an outlook briefing, a standard weather briefing, or an abbreviated weather briefing. Give them 1 through 10 and you're good to go. And then be ready to write, be ready to copy down all the information and it typically is going to come in this format. Uh, remember they work for us so if you have a question or they're talking too fast just tell them to slow down you can tell them it's your first time calling every time you call you can tell them it's your first time calling if you want to <clears throat>